Welcome everyone to our panel discussion around antibiotic resistance. I am Liz Tomsick, Senior Director of the Drug Reference Content Team here at Walters Kalor. Our mission is around helping healthcare providers deliver optimal care to their patients. To that end, I'm very excited to introduce a brilliant group of panelists who have joined us to discuss aspects of antimicrobial stewardship. They will deliver this topic as an illustration of the point of care challenges and how important it is to provide the right drug at the right dose for all patients and the complexities of synthesis of all this knowledge required to provide that information. First, I'd like to introduce Emily. She is an associate professor at the University of Maryland she also serves as the Pharmacy Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship and has a variety of research interests around uh, proper antibiotic use. You have been working with our team as an infectious disease consultant for three years. Uh, and I know in that process, you, I, I'd love to hear about your experiences in working with our team and the development of content. What's the most surprising fact that you have identified in this role? Hi, Liz, and hi, everyone. Um, I think what I've found to be the most surprising is just the number of people like myself that work with you guys behind the scenes. Um, I didn't realize kind of the vast expertise that um, provides a consultant role similar to what I do um, to really just add some depth and clinical experience to the content that's being presented in Lexicom. Thank you so much, Emily. That's, that's a great perspective. Um, I'd like to introduce the rest of our uh, panelists at this point. Um, Sarah is an infectious disease uh, clinical specialist at Walters Kalor for the drug reference content team. Uh, her, in a prior life before this job, she was an infectious disease pharmacist at a large community hospital um, in a Chicago suburb and led antimicrobial stewardship programs for that site and for the health system. She's authored a number of publications around antibiotic stewardship, as well as the pharmacist guide uh, to antimicrobial stewardship. Bill Alvarez, uh, who is our director of clinical content, taking a multidisciplinary approach to frequently used drugs so that clinical guidance is aligned. Um, his roots are, are in cardiology, and he was most recently at the Johns Hopkins uh, University Hospital. With that, uh, I'll pass it to Bill. Thank you for that introduction, Liz. So our story is about synthesizing content through a multidisciplinary team. On the left side is the sum total of the resources that we use to synthesize the information that we provide. We particularly focus on gaining expert clinical insight from both pharmacists and physicians. And instead of just reporting the facts, we go beyond providing just a dose to really synthesizing the content with the goal of improving patient outcomes and providing uh, you the information at your fingertips. Not to mention saving you time as a busy practitioner. We also provide recommendations that are in alignment or harmonized with our other clinical resources so that all stakeholders in clinical care are on the same page of the playbook. One of the many areas that is a large focus for our team are antimicrobials. And we always must ensure that we get the dose right. And to do this, we also must ensure that we are providing clinically relevant and contemporary information to help reduce the major issue of antimicrobial resistance. So with that, Sarah, tell us more about this worldwide issue and how the guidance that we now provide can really impact patient care. Thank you, Bill. Antimicrobial stewardship has been around for a long time. However, gained significant attention in 2013 when the CDC published their antimicrobial resistant threats report. This report stratified resistant pathogens by their level of risk. 
As a result, multiple interventions were implemented nationwide, such as regulatory efforts to require antimicrobial stewardship programs, not just in the hospital setting, but also long-term care facilities and within the community as well. And this, is, this was done to combat resistance. Since then, these efforts have demonstrated a reduction in antimicrobial resistant attributable deaths, as well as decreases in infections caused by these resistant pathogens. Strategies that have been proven to be most effective include tracking and improving antibiotic use across the globe. Despite these efforts, antimicrobial resistance remains a worldwide problem. In the United States, we continue to see approximately 2.8 million cases and 35,000 deaths annually attributed to multidrug resistant infections. The middle row of numbers highlighted in purple represent the number of cases and deaths associated with Clostridium difficile infection, which are most often a direct consequence of antimicrobial consumption. And we also continue to see significant increases in the number of problematic resistant pathogens, such as erythromycin resistant group A strep, drug resistant gonorrhea, and extended spectrum beta lactamase producing Enterobacteraceae. Antimicrobial stewardship involves a coordinated multidisciplinary approach to improve antimicrobial use and patient outcomes while minimizing unintended consequences and associated costs with this overarching goal of patient safety. General concepts include or involve the Ds of stewardship, diagnosis, drug, dose, de-escalation, and duration. These next couple slides provide a few examples of how, with the help of our expert consultants, we have incorporated these Ds into our content to help our users improve antibiotic use. The first D is diagnosis. Piperacillin tazobactam is a broad spectrum agent that is not always warranted for the treatment of diabetic foot infections, but is often used. This example represents how we added just a short note into the dosing content to clarify for our end users the circumstances for which this agent is necessary. That way, if it's not applicable to their patient, the hope is the end user will reevaluate the use of this particular drug for this particular indication. These examples highlight content drug. We include details that guide the user to specific criteria that are required to use the right drug for the right indication, such as any sort of MIC considerations that they should factor in, specific patterns of resistance, or even when an agent should be used as part of an appropriate combination regimen. Dose is the next example and is rep re actually represented over the next couple of slides. Meropenem is a beta-lactam antibiotic that exhibits time-dependent activity. Data support various administration and dosing strategies to optimize use, which isn't necessarily represented in the drug labeling. These data tend to be scattered throughout the literature and difficult to find in one, one location. We have incorporated clinical practical pearls through discussions with our consultants directly within the dosing field for ease of experience accessibility. A number of years ago when I was practicing and we were implementing extended infusion piperacillin tazobactam, stability data actually created the biggest challenge when developing these guidelines for use. Not only just finding the data, but also seeing inconsistencies within the data. And so factoring that into our considerations, we incorporated these data directly into the dosing to again, not only allow for ease of accessibility but also so as to help facilitate a seamless transition for institutions in these cases. This last dose example is within daptomycin. We added a bloodstream spe uh, infection specific indication, which is typically one that is difficult to find as an independent ed entity. And we have incorporated dosing that goes beyond the labeling. Contemporary dosing supported by literature, especially for these challenging resistant pathogens, typically recommend higher doses, and so those have now been included. And as an added advantage, if highlighted down at the bottom, we also began including non-traditional dosing strategies, such as intracatheter use for antibiotic lock technique as shown here, and another example would be intraventricular administration, et cetera. 
De-escalation is one of the more complicated D components to incorporate because traditionally this involves changing from one drug to another drug, or more specifically a broad spectrum agent to an agent that provides a more narrow spectrum of act antimicrobial activity. Users don't typically expect to find information about another drug within a specific drug monograph. That being said, what we have done to be able to provide this information is include general guidance about when to consider de-escalation, such as improvement in the patient's clinical symptoms, when culture and susceptibility data become available, or consideration of patient-specific factors, such as their severity of illness or ability to tolerate an oral diet. The most impactful antimicrobial stewardship D is duration. Duration is an area of study that has gained a lot of attention over the last 10 to 15 years with shorter durations actually being preferable in that they result in less resistance development and improve patient outcomes. Therefore, we have included duration for all indications in which a specific duration is supported by the literature. And when a range is included, we add caveats around when to use the higher end of the duration or the lower end of the range. This is important because this has the largest impact in reduction of overall antimicrobial days of therapy. These are just some of the many examples of how we have incorporated these stewardship pearls within our content through the use of consultants and collaboration with our multidisciplinary teams. And at this time, I'll turn things back over to Bill. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a great overview of a lot of great enhancements to our content. So our approach is very, very multidisciplinary. Um, this collaborative approach really helps to enhance the content in a way to provide users like yourself with synthesized and contemporary clinical drug information that can really be used at the bedside. Many practitioners, similar to Bruce Mueller, interim dean at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy, Consider LexiComp to be their go-to resource for drug dosing recommendations, especially in the critically ill patient. LexiComp is one of the most up-to-date drug references that you can find, and we're proud of that fact. So as we think here about the critically ill patient um, that Bruce Mueller alludes to, Emily, I know you have some definite interest in this area with ensuring that patients are getting the right dose uh, with a lot of critically ill situations, whether it be renal replacement therapies and other things. What are some of the important factors that you consider when individualizing antibiotics for the critically ill? Sure. So I think it's one of the big challenges that clinicians face. If you looked in the package labeling for a drug, the only thing that would guide you as to what should differentiate how a patient's treated um, is their renal function, not taking into account necessarily things like even continuous renal replacement therapy. Our traditional package labeling does not account for changes in volume of distribution in critically ill patients, augmented renal clearance, some external modalities like continuous renal replacement therapy or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. There are so many things that can factor into how a drug um, might be optimized in a patient that's critically ill. Um, we also have to think about patient's body weight, which is not something that usually informs traditional dosing, but can certainly uh, influence what the optimal dose is. Um, so I think all of those things are things that I'm looking for when I'm determining how this drug might be altered in the patient that I'm looking at at the bedside that I know that the package label is not going to help me with and where I'm turning to oftentimes the primary literature. But now uh, LexiConf, because the monographs do have so much more information than they used to in regards to some of these special populations. Yeah, that's it's such an important population to think about. I can remember back in my days of not having that information available. And, um, you know, that was 15 years ago where we didn't have a LexiComp really providing that information um, or providing the best information at, that we knew at the time. Um, so it's critically important to have that information available. Sarah, I thought I'd just ask you a question um, about your presentation and thank you so much for putting that together. Uh, from an antimicrobial stewardship perspective, how are we translating what's going, what Emily and others in her uh, healthcare system, how do we, how do we take what's going on at the healthcare level and incorporate that into our content? 
Sure. So one of the things that I think we do is the majority of us have no problem searching the literature and finding the applicable data to the content that we're working on at any specific time. But being out of practice now for a couple of years, it's kind of like, oh, has this been implemented? How has this been implemented? What are some of the challenges with implementation that have come across? And so that's what's really helpful in reaching out to our consultants to say, what are you doing? What are you seeing? How have you done this? And that guidance that they provide has really informs what we're doing so that it kind of closes that gap. Thank you so much. And and Emily, just in this odd year of challenge and um, many, many critically ill patients and, and patients of lower acuities, are there any changes in antimicrobial resistance patterns that you're seeing within your health system? We certainly have um, had some challenges as it relates to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen a lot of um, increases in antimicrobial utilization, especially early on in the pandemic, just due to a lot of uncertainty about um, whether or not these patients also had concomitant bacterial infections. And also due to some of the prolonged hospitalizations, start to see some of the nosocomial infections that can occur that often have more resistant organisms. So uh, we certainly haven't been in, untouched by um, seeing some of these things at the bedside, unfortunately. Yeah, I can't imagine keeping up with uh, the pandemic and the, the routine illness that occurs in our population. And uh, Sarah, if I could just ask you a quick question on, um, you know, the multidisciplinary approach that we strive to maintain or, you know, reaching out to our expert consultants and also working with our colleagues at Up to Date. Can you describe um, that process and maybe an example of uh, recently that you've experienced and how you've used that multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach to create content? Of course, probably um, the most recent example was the publication of the vancomycin guidelines that, that were recently published. Um, we knew that up to date was working on content surrounding that guideline update and as were we in terms of um, making sure the content is most up to date. Um, we decided to not only work on them simultaneously so that we were doing our edits while they were doing theirs, but also review each other's content. So I was engaged with the physician editors at up to date and they were engaged as well with our content to be able to provide those different perspectives because we all think about things differently. And so it really enhanced not only the content, but also the efficiency of the process so that we were able to get that content out in a timely manner. So it was ready for people to use very quickly after the guidelines were published. I think that's so great. It's just a really nice representation of, of even being on rounds and working with your physician colleagues, nurse colleagues, to really come up with a solution to best treat the patient in front of you. So it's a really great uh, multidisciplinary approach to developing content. Um, I had a question for uh, Emily. So we have, uh, we talked a little bit about obesity dosing or dosing in the obese patient. We spoke a little bit about um, patients whose kidneys are failing or deteriorating and the drug dosing around that uh, comorbidity. And now um, I just wanted to get your opinion about adverse drug reactions. We just released our adverse drug reaction project on Wednesday. And uh, what, what, where do clinicians need, what do they need from an adverse drug reaction um, database? So I think the first thing that people really look for is commonality. So we've all seen like drug commercials where at the end, somebody is saying really, really quickly, everything under the sun that possibly could have been associated with that drug. But what you need to know is how often does a specific adverse effect been associated with the agent that you're treating your patient with and commonality and a breakdown sort of of, of likelihoods. Um, but it also it is nice to have that comprehensive listing as well so that you're not necessarily 
digging through the primary literature case files of every potential adverse effect that's occurred with a patient under the sun. I know personally as a pharmacist, one of the most common questions I get asked is, hey, I have a patient being treated with drug X and then this happened to them. Could it have been associated with the drug? And so it's nice to be able to turn to a reference that has a pretty comprehensive listing of all of the potential adverse effects associated with an agent, but then also provides some degree of commonality. So, you know, is this a very rarely reported like case report level type of thing, or is this something that is um, potentially expected with this agent? And so I think that breakdown is it's tremendously helpful. And our content um, in that new field called uh, Significant Considerations for Adverse Events uh, does focus on a sort of a general summary about the adverse event. Um, as well as a mechanism of action, incidence, duration if it's available, and then risk factors. So what, what patient characteristics may put the patient at risk of, of having this adverse event? Sarah, hi. What, um, if you were to look at our content, uh, and you've been with us for over a year now, what, what would you like to see done? Or what, what do you think our next step is in content development? Well, I think that's a difficult question, mostly because I feel like we're doing it. So a lot of the gaps that I saw when I was practicing, it was the renal dosing, dosing and obesity, and really taking that, that content that's difficult to find and incorporating it throughout that's well-referenced, that the end user can choose to look more in depth if necessary, but also as Emily suggested, is really having it right when you need it and when it matters most and having it be reliable. And so I think that we continue to advance some of those areas. The one thing we've been working on from an infectious diseases standpoint this year is really bulking up the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic um, data within the monographs. So really giving people um, very specific, detailed you know, information on how these antibiotics work and how they can be maximized in an, in an era of antimicrobial resistance. And so I think I would like to see that continue more and expand to more monographs. Um, and so that's probably what I'd say at this point. Emily, where do you think, uh, being on the front lines, what is there any advice that you would give us about um, direction that we need to take or areas that we need to augment either clinically or through digitally through our applications? I think you're already doing a great job of just being nimble. And I've seen the monographs um, be updated so much more frequently than I feel like they were in the past. And, and I think that's great to see, you know, as things emerge in the literature, them being incorporated as needed into the drug information monographs. Um, to grow on what Sarah added, I think that it's really helpful um, to start building in some of the laboratory context as you have been providing information about like uh, minimum inhibitory concentrations and maybe danger zones where you might want to to either provide a higher dose than what would be recommended normally or potentially consider an alter alternative agent entirely. Because um, that information is not always easy to come by. And so helping clinicians put that puzzle together between what they're receiving from their microbiology lab and what's available in the literature into a dose that is going to hopefully be very effective for that patient, I think is key. And so it's great to see some of that information um, being incorporated into the monographs already. And I would love to just uh, see that continue to grow. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liz. What a great discussion. Um, so just to touch base again on our content development, as you can imagine, LexiComp drug information development is a complex process as illustrated here. It's a complex process that really takes multidisciplinary perspectives using the world's experts and tying in that clinical component in addition to what the literature is telling us. And it comes up with a solution for you as a user that provides quality, contemporary, actionable content to help you, the clinician, tread through many of the great areas of clinical practice and delivering it right at the point of care. 
What's exciting is that there's really no drug information provider provider that's capable of doing this. I'm very excited with what we are doing here at Walters Clore with Lexicon. To leave you with some very important key takeaways. One, internal experts and practicing pharmacist, expert pharmacist and physician contributors play a vital role in developing drug information. Secondly, uh, Lexicon clinical drug information goes beyond the dose to provide you, the clinician, with additional information to best treat your patients. And finally, all clinicians, whether you're a nurse, a pharmacist, a physician, can really count on Lexicomp to be aligned or harmonized with our clinical resources so that all clinicians in your institution can be on the same playbook. This has been a great discussion. I really want to thank Emily and Sarah for your thoughtful and very important discussion on what we are doing as it relates to antimicrobial stewardship and the role of the expert pharmacist contributor, not to mention all the work you've already done to provide our users with these important principles within our content. I know I've learned a lot from this time with you, and I hope that everyone out there listening to our discussion now has a great appreciation for how LexiComp develops content with the goal of improving patient outcomes. So thanks once again. If you as a listener would like more information on LexiComp and other clinical resources we provide, please visit our website at walterskluer.com. Thank you for taking the time to join us today.